So uh, thank you everyone for joining. Uh, as usual, my name is Nathan. I am the marketing manager at Data Science Dojo. And I have Jimmy Nguyen here with us today. He is a senior data scientist at LinkedIn, but he wasn't always. So we're here to learn about his journey. And, you know, we're here to ask him questions and, and you know, everything like that. Also want to mention for Q&A today, um, please put it in the Q&A tab. And then if you like a question, give it an upvote um, because that just tells us which questions are more popular, right? So, um, uh, and if you're on one of our live streams, ask your questions in the chat. We'll pull, the, pull those into Zoom for you as well. Um, so Jimmy, I think that's all I have. So why don't you go ahead and take over and we can, we can stop this flickering screen share. All right, sounds good. Thanks, Nathan, for the introduction and for keeping the audience warm. Um, hi, everyone. Happy Friday, wherever you're coming from. Um, I can't see you, but hopefully you can see me. Um, uh, my name is Jimmy. Uh, I'm a data scientist at LinkedIn. Uh, I've been at LinkedIn for ooh, uh, seven and a half years now. Um, and then prior to that, I worked at a company called Symantec for about two years. So believe it or not, I've been working for about 10 years now. Um, uh, you guys can kind of see my screen. Uh, thank you all for joining me today. Um, just wanted to spend some time and share with you kind of the, I guess, basically my career journey from, um, I guess, my goal to get to data science, right? And then once I got there, the challenges I faced getting through it and still going through it today, right? So um, you can kind of see me here. This is a picture my wife took uh, a year ago when we were in uh, Mendocino uh, doing a camping trip. Um, and this is a, a life model that I've always lived by, right? So one is always work hard, right? Um, but in addition to work hard, you have to believe in what you do, right? You have to believe that you're capable of achieving your goal. Right? Otherwise, you're just going through the motion, right? Um, of course, uh, and of course, have a positive attitude, right? Uh, so those things, work hard, believe in yourself, have a positive attitude, right? So first of all, uh, nothing, I'm super casual down to earth. So I have created sort of like a nice to meet you slides, a little bit of facts about myself, just fun facts. Um, and then maybe behind that, I'll give also reasonings as to like who I am as a person, what makes me tick, like why I do what I do, right? Um, and then after that, I'll take you uh, through my journey of uh, getting to data science from when I started, I think 2013 was when I had the goal, um, all the way till now, uh, being a data scientist at LinkedIn and doing my best to kick ass and not get my ass kicked every day, right? So <laughs> Um, I'll follow up and finalize with life learnings and then just open it up to questions. And I think I have until like two o'clock, so I'll stay um, until then and I'll just try to answer as many questions as I can, all right? Um, of course, this little disclosure, opinions expressed are solely of my own and do not express the views or opinions of my employer. Uh, I'm not a legal guy. I don't know how much that'll protect me, but um, these are my, this is my own story, right? My own opinions, right? And I hope that in sharing with you, maybe you can get something from it, all right? So... First of all, nice to meet you. Fun facts. Uh, as Nathan mentioned, I was talking a little. I am a Silicon Valley native, born and raised in San Jose, went to school in San Jose, went to high school, college, and grad school all in San Jose. Um, so never left. Uh, I'm, I'm biased when I say I really like San Jose, but I mean, what can you do, right? Um, I'm the elder sibling. I have a younger brother um, who also works at LinkedIn with me, by the way. I think he joined in uh, last December, right? Um, uh, you can tell we... I think we look similar. It's really funny. Like sometimes people will say, oh yeah, Jimmy, they, it's very polar opposite. Either people will say, hey, Jimmy, you look really close and similar to your brother. Or it's like, dude, you guys are completely different. But um, he's my brother. Uh, I love him to death. Kevin, if you're out there, what's up, man? Um, I'm married to my university sweetheart of uh, 11 years. We met in, geez, fall of 2010 in uh, Santa Clara University, O'Connor Hall, room 20, oh, she's going to kill me, 207, I believe. Uh, in advanced calculus. Um, she uh, is, she and I were both math majors and uh, we were friends for like two years uh, at first and we were best friends. We did all the problem sets together and then I was like, hey, you know, I really like you, this can work and uh, I'm uh, still lucky to have her, right? So we got married three years ago and uh, having the time of our lives, right? Um, I have a wide plethora, plethora of hobbies. Um, I think when I was nine, my parents took away my TV uh, I was watching too much TV. So I invested all this time into a bunch of random hobbies. Uh, huge tennis player. Uh, for those that play, I'm the NTRP 4.550, right? Uh, still playing. Made it to sectionals. We're hopefully going to go playoffs uh, soon. Uh, singing. Don't know how good I am at singing, but uh, I love to sing. Uh, it's just fun. It makes me feel good. Sometimes I'll drive to work in the morning. I'll just sing in my car. 
Um, yo-yos. Me and my brother got really into yo-yos for a few years, right? Um, I play Magic the Gathering. I like pay for little pieces of cardboard so I can play with my friends, right? Um, really fun pastime that I, I never gave up. Um, love to read. I read fiction, nonfiction, uh, the news, everything, right? So always growing your knowledge base, really important, right? Um, gardening is something I picked up pretty recently, right? Um, <laughs> DDR. Uh, for those of you who know, Dance Dance Revolution was an old school like dance game that I also played with my brother growing up. Um, I've been playing it for like 15 years. We actually have a machine at LinkedIn. Um, so sometimes when I'll, you know, just want to work out or something, I'll go out and dance on that machine and casual gaming, not a professional gamer by any stretch of imagination, but um, I uh, play games sometimes just to pass time or spend time with friends. Um, my Myers-Briggs, for those of you who have taken this test, uh, it says that I'm an ESFJ, which is like this sort of like supportive console caring role, right? And the funniest thing, right, is when you look at like career suggestions for ESFJ, you'll say like teacher, ad HR admin, right? Um, and there's a section that says roles that ESFJs wouldn't enjoy, software engineer, economist, right, scientist, and I'm like, hmm, definitely an oddball here. <laughs> so, but it's okay. For whatever reason, I thought it was a fun fact. And um, I'm not scared of spiders, I'm not scared of snakes, right? Kill spiders with a bare hand, no problem. I am so scared of garden worms. I don't even know why. Like I just dig them up. Like my wife and I'll be gardening, I'll dig them up and I'll be like, can't touch that, not touching that. But um, some fun facts for you about myself. Um, and then some more serious facts, I think life facts, right? I, I am the son of uh, Vietnamese refugees. I think without getting into too many, much details, uh, I think that just, that gives me a lot of motivation and drive, right? Um, I, I know, um, so for those of you who know, there was a war in Vietnam in 1975 and both of my parents escaped from that war. And by escape, you mean like, I mean like risk your life in the middle of the night, get on a boat and, and go out in the ocean, right? And so a lot of people would, would die from that, right? Um, but they wanted a better future for their um, next generations, right? And so I, I understand that those who have come before me have made a lot of sacrifices for me and that drives me to, to live a life to the fullest, to honor that legacy, right? Um, so that's, that's why I do what I do. That's actually why I'm a data scientist. Uh, I'm definitely an optimist, if you can't tell. <laughs> uh, the glass is definitely half full and that's okay if we empty it because we're just gonna get another glass, right? Um, <laughs> uh, I think my purpose as I've gotten older is definitely to make life more worthwhile for others. Um, you know, I think, I think as far as I know, at the end of the day, we're all gonna, we all go to the same, all the chess pieces go to the same, box, right? We're all going to pass away, right? So while you're here, you know, make it as easy or as best as you can for other people, right? So I try my best to go out of my way to help people as much as I can, right? Uh, most important life skills are SQL and Excel, obviously, and R and Python. No, I'm kidding. Um, the most important life skills, I think, are um, perseverance, right? Sticking with something, right? If you believe it, you really want it, right? Stick with it, right? And empathy, right? Being able to understand your fellow human, right? Um, at the end of the day, that's what connects us all, I think, right? And uh, I, I look up to my parents. Again, they've sacrificed so much for me and for what they've done. And I think uh, I, I always dealt a very good um, hand of cards in life. Like you can't control that, right? Some people are born in certain situations with the other versus others. I was born to, I think, the best parents in the world, right? They taught me. I think they raised me right, right? Um, I mean, but that's kind of biased, but yeah. But I, I sincerely believe that, all right? Um, so yeah, that's me. Nice to meet you. And thank you for your time. Happy Friday. I'm all right. So that's me. And now we're going to talk about, uh, or I'm going to have the opportunity to share with you, I guess the journey I went through to get to data science. So I set the goal of becoming a data scientist when I was a financial analyst at Symantec, right? Uh, in February, 2013. And uh, achieved this goal in October of 2017, after uh, four and a half years of flailing about boldly, purposely, and with style, all right? And you can see in the background, there's a, there's a Pokemon uh, in the back. Uh, and for those of you who play Pokemon or who, those who don't play Pokemon, uh, this Pokemon is Magikarp. And for those of you that don't, Magikarp uh, doesn't really have any attacks. He has one attack, which is called Splash, and it does absolutely nothing. He just splashes around, right? And so sometimes when going through this journey, I felt like, you know, I feel like Magikarp. I'm just splashing around, doing my best, right? Uh, but you know, I, I stuck it out, perseverance, right? So. Here we go. Okay. Um, on the left side, you'll see kind of like the accumulated experience that I've had through each year, just kind of summarize what I've done through each year. And then on the right are some details. So I'll just tell the story. These are just talking points, right? 
So the journey starts in January 2017. This was three months into my first job, straight out of college, fresh out, super eager, right? Um, as a as a financial analyst, an NCG financial analyst uh, at at Symantec, and NCG means new college graduate, right? So we were a little cohort of new college grads, fresh blood, as they called it, and they hired us into Symantec, right? Um, and this was sort of like a rotation program. So I was in this finance rotation program, right? And you can choose like once a year, you could choose one of I think 10 or 12 departments, right? Um, and then you spend a year there and then you rotate to another department. Uh, now, I think the nice thing was the budget for our salaries came from the office of the CFO directly, right? So any team that got, so th th from the team's perspective, it was actually quite appealing for the teams to take us because for them, essentially, I think it was like a free, free resource, right? And so, um, and then for, for us as new college grads, it was really good because we got to learn different parts of the business and we got to see how finance as a unit functioned, right? Um, so, I was a new college graduate financial analyst, right? Um, and in university, I had studied finance and math. I was double major. So at the time, this made sense, right? Um, and I, as I was doing this role, I remember I, one of the first things I remember was writing my first nested if statement. So like, you know, in Excel, you can actually do if statements, right? You can say, if this condition is true, then do this, I'll do this. But you can put if, states in, if statements inside of your statements, so just like you could in any other programming language, right? Um, but I first discovered this through Excel, right? And I'm like, wow, this is really fun, right? Because this kind of reminds me of my programming classes and math and this logical thinking, right? And I began to get really good at it, right? And so I began to kind of get uh, a reputation in my first team, at least, for like automating all these dashboards, right? So I would take these spreadsheets that these other um, analysts would manage, right? And I'd be like, oh yeah, I, I love automating this stuff. So let me just start automating that, right? Um, and uh, what, what team was, I was on, SEC reporting, right? So for those of you who don't know, SEC reporting, I think, is the preparation of a company's quarterly and annual statements, so the 10Q and the 10K, right? Um, and so that was my first rotation. So primarily accountants that I'm saying, right? But yeah, so I, I worked on spreadsheets. I loved Excel, right? <laughs> I, I learned how to use Excel without a mouse on a PC. So you can actually do everything with a keyboard, right? Um, you can all, everything that you do in Excel, like macros and formulas, all that, you can do it all with a keyboard. And if you're fast enough, you can do things at the speed of thought, right? So you can just kind of think it and then it'll become muscle memory because you're doing it with your fingers, right? And then it'll just, it just goes. It's one of the most fun things is pedaling around in Excel, right? Um, and I think in hindsight, starting in this role really helped me because uh, Excel is kind of tabular, right? There's different tabs and there's tables of data and then you can link these tables with formulas, right? Um, and some of the formulas in Excel when you link tables are actually surprisingly similar to formulas like joins in SQL, right? So, but at the time I didn't know what the heck SQL was. SQL to me was like a SQL to a book. Like, is that what it is, right? But um, so yeah, I, 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 it was a really good foundation because it showed me like, okay, here are two tables. Here's like an ID column and here's how you link them, right? Um, and so uh, work, continue working through this finance role, right? Um, in February, 2013, I had heard of this role, this emerging field called data science. Um, now at the time, data science was not the field it was today. Right, it was not established. Right, there was no data science masters or anything. Right, uh, I just knew this was up and coming field, and I saw it. I'm like, wow, that sounds like something that ultimately one day I'd like to do. Right, because it takes into consideration both the sort of math background that I have with my interest in it, as well as the business side, because I want to drive impact from a business standpoint. Right, so I had this goal. Right, but then I looked up, wow, these people who are data scientists, super qualified. They have a master's, PhD. Right, um, they go to top schools. Right, you know, the whole shebang. Right. Uh, but I'm like, okay, let me just put so kind of like pie in the sky. Here's my goal, right? So I started this document on my desktop and I remember called titling it Road to Data Science. Like, okay, what do I need to do, right? Um, and so I was like, okay, well, I am, it looks like the only type of people uh, or the only type of degrees that you can get into this data science role with is either you're really good at stats or you're really good at computer science. Uh, definitely not a CS guy, right? Um, in hindsight, maybe I should have done the CS uh, major, right? But I did. I was a math major, right? Um, so I figured, okay, well, at least I had I had the foundations to get pretty good at stats, right? So I applied to uh, the MS in statistics program at my local school, San Jose State, which is about twenty minutes away from my home right now, right? So all kind of in the San Jose bubble, right? Um, and then in August in twenty thirteen, I started my part time masters in statistics at San Jose State, San Jose State. Um, university taking math 163, which was math, probability theory, and methods, right? So keep in mind, I was doing this 
uh, part-time while working full-time, right? So there's pros and cons to that. If you have questions about that later, I'm more than happy to answer, right? Now, at the time, there was no online courses. So I had to drive my ass to school twice a week, right? In traffic, right? So I would leave the office, I remember, at like five, and then I'd get to school by six, right? Because traffic from um, uh, this area in San Jose, or in the Bay Area called Mountain View, down to San Jose was about an hour during rush hour, right? Um, so twice a week, I'd drive to school to, you know, learn about math, right? Um, and uh, so the, the program was 13 classes, and it was a semester. And at first I tried doing like two classes at once. And that was just like, <laughs> nope, I can't do two classes in work. That's just impossible, right? So I ended up doing one class, but then if you do the math, if it's one class per semester and there's two semesters per year, that's gonna take you six and a half years to finish your master's. But I'm like, yeah, let's do it. Let's go for it, right? Uh, I can take one break uh, one semester somewhere, right? Uh, so yeah, first class in uh, December, 2013, got an A minus in the class, not too bad, right? Um, Pretty proud of myself for doing that as well as for work. So that's my first year, 2013, right? I built strong Excel foundations, right? Um, set my sights on data science as a goal and started my MS in statistics, right? So 2014 rolls around. January 14, I take my second class, Math 261A, which is regression theory and methods, right? Um, the funniest story ever. So I get my first homework assignment in R, right? Which is a programming language, right? For data scientists, right? And I did the entire thing on the little command line shell, thinking that after I closed the program, it would just save my work. And so I spent like three hours doing this homework and it's like 11.45, I'm like, ah, oh, I'm done. I think the answers are right. I scroll up and down through my command line, looks right, I close the program and I'm like, wait, shit. <laughs> Is that how I'm supposed to save my work? And I didn't realize I was supposed to use, uh, in Studio. you have this sort of like area where you can type in your code, right? I didn't realize that I could save my, I should have saved my work to the side, so. I had to do that assignment again, right? Uh, epic fails, but hey, everyone starts somewhere, right? Um, so now I'm, I'm, I'm in my second class. I'm at my job in my SEC reporting job, getting really good at Excel, right? Um, and because it's a rotation program, in May of 2014, I had a chance to transfer to the business intelligence group within finance. So if you think about finance, finance folks do work with data, right? And there's a team that kind of manages that data. And of course, that data is usually scored, stored in like a relational database. So we had a BI team, business intelligence, and that was the team. And I figured, okay, if I'm going to be a data scientist, I need to be um, good at analysis, right? Which I'm kind of working on with my stats masters as well as my Excel, right? So I'm getting, I'm getting to use, I'm getting used to data, learning how to connect data with like VLOOKUPs and stuff, right? Learning, starting to learn some statistical techniques in regression, like linear regression, right? What are the assumptions, right? Gauss Markov assumptions, all these things, right? Um, so I'm starting to get some chops there, but I realized that I didn't know how to like pull data or get data myself. And then I look at this team, I'm like, huh, that makes sense as the next rotation. So I used my rotation to kind of get myself into that BI position, right? And this was, I met, uh, I think one of my first mentors, if you're out there, my three, uh, hello, right? Thank you for all you've done. <laughs> um, this, this woman taught me the difference. She taught me how to join things in SQL. She taught me the basics of SQL, right? Select star from left join, right join, um, inner versus outer, right? Um, and I remember thinking like, I, I, it, was one, it was a cloudy day and I was comparing the results of a left join in SQL versus a VLOOKUP in Excel, right? So now for a VLOOKUP in Excel, let's say you have one ID in the reference table and like five IDs in the, uh, I guess, or the base table and then five IDs in the, in the reference table, right? Excel will actually only find that ID in that reference column, right? And even if that, if that value, let's say it's one, is duplicated five times in the other table and you do a VLOOKUP, it'll only return the first value associated with that one, right? But in SQL, right, if you do a left join with a table with an ID one here, just showed up once, and then the ID one shows up five times here, it'll actually duplicate the row four additional times, right? And I'm sitting there comparing SQL and VLOOKUP and I'm like, holy crap, this is like a whole nother world. This is crazy, right? So this is where I kind of started learning like how to pull data from a database and then how to visualize it. And at the time we used a tool called the ClickView, right? Which is kind of a cousin to Tableau. I think at the time like Tableau was like up and coming um, and ClickView was somewhat established. Uh, I don't know, I'm not sure, but I uh, don't use ClickView anymore. <laughs> but it did teach me the fundamentals like building like, okay, a nice dashboard that people can read people interact with, people can filter, right? So I joined this team in May of 2014, right? And I started to pick up these skills, right? 
Uh, August 2014, uh, took my third, take my third class, now a year into my master's, so a year and then this is my third semester. Um, CS256, Topics in Artificial Intelligence. And this class was worth its weight in gold. It exposed me to the basic algorithms of machine learning, right? So um, algorithms like naive Bayes classifiers, random forests, decision trees, right? Support vector machines, uh, KNN, right? Cl clustering, right? And um, we, the book was Introduction to Elements of Statistical Learning. I still use that book. It's amazing, amazing book. I have a copy here in this day and age. It's actually online for free. Um, this PDF, the authors, I think I've made it free. So uh, Google it, it's right there. Um, but man, that class exposed me to the world of machine learning. And machine learning is, and in my, at least in my mind, you have stats in one bucket and you have machine learning in the other, right? Stats is kind of based on math and inference, right? But machine learning was just this completely computational heavy way of approaching essentially more or less the same problem, a classification problem, right? And so it exposed me to this other way of thinking, right? Um, but man, in hindsight, I think that class was worth the weight in gold. We worked through the math behind the algorithms. It was something else, I learned a lot. Um, and then, so this is 2014, I'm still at Symantec. December, 2014, LinkedIn reaches out to me <laughs> on LinkedIn, right? Hey, so that works, platform works, right? Make sure you guys use it. Um, and uh, so at the time, you can imagine, there's this 23 year old kid who's, extremely focused on his career. He's working full-time. He's got the, the guts to do a master's part-time on top of that, right? Uh, foregoing most of his social <laughs> life, uh, I will say. Um, so I was very career-focused. And so for, to have a company, I, I believe in, I, I still believe in the product today, right? But back then I also believed in the product in a sense that, it, 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 I believe in LinkedIn, in a sense that it gave me a chance to showcase who I was and what I have done in my career, right? Uh, it's kind of the Facebook for professionals, right? And I was really proud of what I'd done professionally. So I love the website where you can just kind of put down your accomplishments, right? So LinkedIn reaches out to me, right? And at the time it was also a very good company. It still is, right? Uh, whew, safe call. It was still a great company, right? But at the time it was like number one, number two place to work, right? I was like, wow, this is great. Good opportunity, right? The only issue was this role was in HR, right? Uh, but I'm like, you know, they, I, uh, it's LinkedIn. Let me talk to them anyway, right? See what they want, right? So that was 2014. So 2014 in summary, building statistical foundations, building database foundations, right? Um, and, and exposure to machine learning. Basically all the kind of touch bases, they're the basis of uh, data science, right? Sip of water, one sec. I guarantee you it's water. Um, <laughs> not kidding, it is water. Um, so 2015 comes around, <laughs> 2015 comes around, right? February 15, I joined LinkedIn in human resources. Okay, as a compensation analyst. All right. Uh, now, uh, when I took the offer, it was presented to me as a very uh, data driven job, right? I didn't, it sounded like they needed a data driven guy to HR to help build out their analytics function and compensation, right? And this is a team that works with employee salaries, right? So that was a fun trip, too. Um, and, and the second thing was they were paying me a lot more than what Semantic was paying me, right? Uh, I think like, I think it was like a 80% raise when I was, when I joined. Um, uh, LinkedIn, right? So either I was making a lot of LinkedIn or making very little of Symantec, and I'll let you figure that out, right? Um, it was, uh, so I joined LinkedIn, a few things. First of all, I noticed, <laughs> first and foremost, the food was amazing. Uh, <laughs> LinkedIn 15 is a real thing. For those of you at LinkedIn, hello, thank you for joining. Um, but the first thing I noticed was it was a very data-driven culture, right? Even, even when in HR, right? Everything that people did, they always try to back it up with data, right? And I think this definitely is a tone that the company sets at the top and still does today. And I think as a data scientist, that makes my job a lot easier, right? But again, at the time I noticed, the first thing I noticed, very data-driven culture, right? Um, but in some ways within two months, I realized maybe going to HR wasn't the best move in trying to get to data science. Um, but, uh, and I, I reflected on that. I'm like, okay, did I make the wrong move? Like, I remember I was a month in and I started like looking as like, should I interview for data analyst jobs outside of LinkedIn, right? Uh, this compensation analyst role is, is, uh, is good, but it wasn't quite aligned with what I wanted to do. But I had, I think to this day, still, I think one of the best managers in my career, Rich Cayetano, if you're out there, hello, right? Um, he was amazing. He, he sat me down and he's like, look, Jimmy, I know you're interested in analytics, right? But you, he told me, I remember this. He told me, you can shape this role the way you want it to be, right? You can be any type of compensation analyst you want to be, right? And I took those words to heart. I didn't let this role define me, right? And I had a great manager, right? Um, and so I'm like, fine, I don't care what you call me, right? You can call me a compensation. You can call me whatever you want, right? But I am going to be, to the best of my ability, 
a data scientist in this job, right? I'm going to continue to teach myself coding. I'm going to continue to go to school, right? I'm going to continue to work towards this, 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 this goal of mine, right? And I, I looked at the data science team at LinkedIn too, and they were top notch, right? And in hindsight, maybe, you know, maybe I shouldn't have been intimidated by the, you know, maybe fancy schools that they went to or the, 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 but the, the strength of this team at the time when I looked at them was like, wow, man, how do, how am I ever going to bridge this gap? I, I, you know, I, I went to San Jose state, Santa Clara, you know, local state schools. Right. Um, and I was very intimidated, um, by what I saw. Um, but you know, I kept going and, um, did, being proactive with my role, trying to take what data I have and make interesting projects out of it. And in June of 2015, uh, I managed to finagle a project with the talent analytic team on predicting nutrition. Now the talent analytics team, great team, great people, right? At the time they, I think they were consulting from finance. They had consulted out to HR to help them with the more analytical problems, right? Problems around org structure. And uh, at the time, I think they were working on trying to figure out who was, who was leaving the company, right? Um, and I was like, okay, well, let me try just to play with that on my own, on my own, like not tell anyone, just play, play, play with it on my own, on my desktop, on my, on my spare time, right? Whatever spare time I have, right? Um, and I was standing in the salad line, building 605 West Mott, which is a brick and mortar cafe. I still remember this very, and I stood next to one of the managers on the team. And uh, he asked me, hey, Jimmy, how's it going? Because he, he knew I was an analytics guy. I was interested in stats, right? So me and him, we talk sometimes. And he said, hey, Jimmy, how's it going on the comp team? And I told him, oh, you know, um, I'm just, you know, working on uh, a model to try to predict um, who would leave the company. And I'm using some machine learning. I was using naive based classifier. And he's like, oh, wow, really interesting. Uh, can, you don't want to sync up? Can, do you want to sync up more? And maybe I can bring some of my team members and we can talk about it, right? And I, I saw this as an opportunity, right? I'm like, oh, okay. Um, so I prepared, <laughs> I prepared for like two days for this meeting, right? So I, I went through the math, naive days again. It's like, oh, okay, conditional probability, expand it out, multiply it, assume independence so you can multiply different. And then wrote together this nice paper, put together a presentation, and I present two days later to the manager, right? And he's like, whoa, Jimmy, this is amazing, right? And so he, he, from that opportunity, right, he paired me up with someone on his team to work on this predictive attrition model, right? And we had worked on it and we actually delivered a pretty good product uh, the first time around. But uh, I think we were predicting like sales attrition, folk for sales, I don't, I don't remember. But I do remember one thing which really grinded my gears, which is that no matter what happened, when I went into a meeting presenting this work or talking about this work, it always came across that I was sort of like the HR guy, right? Who didn't know the math, didn't know the stats, right? He was just there to provide the data, right? Because he was on the compensation team. I don't know if this was true or not, but this was how I felt internally. And it hurt, I think, because I was trying so hard to become a data scientist, right? To be a data scientist. And then here I was, you know, at least in my mind, being perceived as this, this HR guy, right? Um, and so the optics of the situation were tough, right? Now, so I continued doing this. And uh, I had a friend who worked uh, in the PMM team, I think, uh, in HR or something like that. But October 2015, she had a friend. So my friend in HR had a friend in data science who was a manager. And this manager in data science was looking for a contractor role in data science, right? So she lets me know because I was interested in analytics and I made people <laughs> pretty aware of that, right? Um, and, uh, and so I met with this manager and what I, I learned, she introduced me to her friend in analytics who was a manager. Um, and I, I met with this person and I learned that this role was a contract role. Now, for those of you who don't know, full-time employees, they have, uh, if you're not a U.S. citizen, you get visa benefit, you, you, you have your visa, right? Uh, it's one of the ways you could, uh, come, I guess, to the States and work, right? Um, but you have benefits too, vision, dental, all these things. I think, I believe contractor is, I think, paid by hour, right? So this was a data science contract role, right? And I was so willing to be, I wanted to be a data scientist so bad that I actually went for the interview knowing that I would give up my benefits, my full-time benefits, 401k, right? Uh, I just wanted that knowledge, right? Um, and I, I did the interview and I failed miserably. I, I remember they asked me one of these questions. It was like, so Jimmy, if you have a, a text file, right? How would you count the number of rows in that text file, right? And I was like, oh yeah, you just put it in a spreadsheet and you scroll down to the bottom and that's how many rows there are, right? And so, yeah, that, that, that interview didn't work out very well. Um, I think my product sense was also really bad at the time, right? Um, so that was, um, that was 2015, right? So it, I think in summary, 
Uh, it was basically 2013, 2014 continued with respect to my master's, growing my skills. Uh, I was I joined LinkedIn. That was a big one, right? And I, I didn't let my, my situation in HR, right, determine who I was or what my profession or what I could do or what I couldn't do, right? I said, okay, it doesn't matter, right, what my title is, where I work. It's, it's what you do, right? With the 24 hours that is given to you, that's the choice. That's the one thing you can control. So control that, right? If you want to be a data scientist, be a data scientist, right? Do it, right? Show it through your actions, right? Um, and so I took that mindset and I really ingrained it into my personality, right? And of course, I failed my first attempt at getting into data science at LinkedIn, right? Um, so 2016 comes around and I continue with this trend, right? I can continue to push analytics into the compensation space, right? So I'm doing things like predicting who would accept the job offer, right? Um, combining LinkedIn data with internal data. Of course, this all didn't really pan out because this is just me kind of coding in my own little bubble, right? Um, seeing who we hire from, right? How their performance is, right? How much are we paying them? Does it really justify the salary, right? These things. Um, again, analyses that I did um, uh, internally to, with, uh, with HR data, right? Um, and then using things like clustering techniques to cluster job ranges and try to find new job ranges for, for um for employees and for the employee job ranges, but just um, continue to push analytics and just continue trying to grow myself, right? Um, in spring of 2016, I take a class called mathematical statistics and I get a B plus, right? And so this for grad school, if you know anything below an A is not the best, right? Um, and I, 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 so when you when you work hard at something, I think, or when you try to do something well, like your work or whatever it is you're working on, you draw a lot of self esteem. I think from doing something really well. So I, I, I thought I was a pretty good student and I thought I was a pretty good employee. So when I got this B plus, I'm like, man, like I doing the, I'm grinding my gears. I'm doing the best I can. I'm pushing myself to my limits. Right. And I, I, I remember I had the, I think the lowest score <laughs> on the second midterm in this class. And I, uh, when I went into my professor's office hours, I was on the verge of tears and, you know, she sat me down and I remember she told me like, look, Jimmy, I know you're good. Okay, like I can see it in you. You have the potential to be a great uh, student, a great uh, stats student, right? But you have too much going on. That's okay, right? It's okay not to, to do well here. You just have to pick your battles, right? And I think at that point, I, I made some sort of subtle, I was almost subconscious shift between putting so much self-esteem and doing well in school and just be like, you know, just, just do your best, man. Like, you're, the balls are going to drop at some point. Like the balls that you're juggling are going to drop at some point. You can't do it all, right? Um, and so I remember having that conversation and just definitely taking a step back from taking school as seriously. Like, okay, do your best, just learn, right? Um, and so pushing through spring and then summer, in November of 2016, um, the one of the members on the talent analytics team had a chance uh, or went on maternity leave, right? And so they uh, actually reached out to me and my manager uh, at times so though I was in compensation. I said, hey, you know, uh, one of our team members go on maternity leave and we know Jimmy's really interested in analytics and he's been working with us in the past. Uh, can he support? Uh, can he split his time between compensation and, and talent analytics, right? And my manager, to his credit, he allowed me to do it, right? And so kind of had to manage relationship between my team and talent analytics team and basically it was working two jobs, right? So supporting compensation, supporting talent analytics, um, and I did really well, right? I was, again, very passionate about analytics. So these projects were just like all opportunities for me, right? Um, and uh, did well in that rotation. And then, so in December of 2016, uh, there was an opening on the BizOps, Business Operations Analytics Team, which was a sister team to the talent analytics team. Um, and uh, there was an opening and then they reached out to me and said, hey, Jimmy, do you want to interview for this role, right? So kind of a sister's team to data science because they do more like analytics related work, right? Um, and so I interview for this role and, um, I didn't get it. <laughs> so, um, I made it farther than last time. I was able to answer some of the more technical questions, but, um, I think, uh, yeah, at the end of the day, it didn't work out. Right. So 2016 building definitely my reputation within HR, uh, with analytics, right. Uh, identity was evolving, definitely shifting a away. Some of the self-esteem that I placed on doing well in school to just, Hey, do your best. Right. Just, you know, dance a beautiful dance, run a beautiful race, right? Um, and then continue to learn, right? And of course, fail attempt at getting to data science number two, right? Or in this case, analytics number two, right? So 2017 comes along right now. 
So in, in March of 2020, this is where things got pretty spicy. So in March of 2020, my, my compensation manager sat me down. I was like, look, Jimmy, you're doing great work in compensation the last two years, right? Can I introduce you to maybe a friend of mine in data science at LinkedIn, right? So I got to meet a director in LinkedIn. Shin, if you're out there, hi. <laughs> and thank you for the opportunity um, to meet and to work with you. Um, and, but I met Shin in March of 20, uh, 2017. I said 20, March 2020. This says March 2020, should, should say March of 2017. Um, I met Shin in March of 2017 and through the introduction for my manager, right? In compensation. And I told Shin, look Shin, okay. I have been doing data science in a closet by myself for the last three or four years. I have been doing side projects. I have been doing my masters. I have been doing online Coursera course. I think by then I had done like 10 Coursera courses, right? Um, with limited guidance from industry professionals who could help me, right? I asked them, let me work for you for free, okay? On my nights, on my weekends, I've been doing it already, right? I have done two jobs in the past. I work with talent analytics and uh, compensation and I did great. My performance reviews are fine, so I can handle it. Let me work for you for free, okay? Give me, give me your list of OKRs your, from your team, right? I will go through, I will pick the shittiest projects, people, projects don't, that people don't want. Okay, just give them to me. I will do them. Okay, you, you win, right? You get a free headcount. I win. I get free learning. Everybody wins. The only thing I lose is sleep, right? And I don't care at this point, right? Because I really want this data science job, right? Or at least give me the experience, right? And in my mind, I was thinking, dude, I don't care if I get this job or not. Because once I get that learning, once I work on these projects, nobody can take away that knowledge from me, right? And I can take that knowledge. I can interview anywhere, right? So to me, this was an opportunity. Right, so I, he paired me up with two of his data scientists, Tan and Albert, hi, <laughs> you're out there. Um, and I put together a project plan for, for, for three months. We talked about projects, what to work on, right? And I sent an email to my compensation manager, CCing Jin, right? And I said, okay, here's what we work on for April, May, and June, 2017, right? Oh man, I opened this can of worms. So this is two jobs, H job a day, DS by night. So this is where things got crazy. Um, yeah, so first things first, right? You start this rotation, April, 2017, two jobs, right? What are you gonna do? Shoot, HR only works on PCs. You know, data scientists only work on Mac. The programs that are written and support for data science, all written with Mac in mind. No, uh, very, very few people in, in engineering use, um, use a PC, I believe. So first order of business, find a Mac. I go to the IT department and I say, guys, Give me the most beat up loner Mac you got, right? Just some old clunker you have in the back. I don't care, right? Give it to me, right? I'll take it, right? They set me up. I get approvals from my manager. They set me up with this old Mac, like super old, but it works. Slow as hell, but it works, right? Um, taught myself, started teaching myself command line, pig. Pig is in high were querying languages, not as common now. Um, command line, right? Um, man, so many things. Like, the data in data science was so massive. Like you, in, in, in SQL and in Excel and HR, it was all fitting into like spreadsheets. You can query, you can look at it. In data science, you were doing like terabytes of data a day. Like I had so much trouble onboarding myself on that. Um, and then I was sitting in the HR building, right? Um, and, uh, and, and data science was in the engineering building, right? And this was summer, right? it was getting hot, right? So I had to kind of like bike back and forth between the buildings or like a quarter of a mile apart or a third of the mile apart. Uh, to get help from people, right? So I'm like reading wikis during the day and night and just trying to do this thing. And the first few projects were so tough, learning pig and, and then the hive. Like I remember, so in data science, you have to build your own data science pipelines, right? And I, my first pipeline, which was assigned to me by one of my mentors, I was like, hey, Jimmy, can you get this done by this time? Just kind of onboard this metric and, and get it up and running so they could run every day and generate data, right? And I, I didn't, I, I wrote the code. It was like 500 lines of code and I submitted it to my mentor and she didn't take it. She actually scrapped it and she wrote one herself. Right. Um, and she was up till like 1130 doing it. And uh, so my, my pig and hive code were, well, my pig, my pig code was atrocious. Right. Um, I didn't know anything about Git. I didn't know anything about command line. And so I would do things like you would output the results on the command line. And I didn't know how to like use commands to copy it onto my desktop. So I would, dump the results to the screen, copy a section of it, paste it to a spreadsheet, scroll down on the command line and just keep doing that. It took me like 45 minutes to, to download the output onto my screen, right? Um, 
And uh, it was uh, it was just a tough situation all around. I, I definitely, I remember physically feeling like my brain was like hurting, just trying to learn all these things, right? Um, but I, I stuck it out. Like you just, you just keep going. You don't give up. Every day is an opportunity, you know, right? Like just, just show up and do your best, right? Um, and so like you, 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 uh, there's also a scenario where it was like, you had to kind of manage your relationship between uh, your managers, both HR and data science. Say, hey, I have a project to work on during the day. Can I get this back to you by tomorrow? And then you have to work the night to figure it out. Um, teaching myself this, man, that was so tough. Like writing optimal pig. I, I remember I would write code, but it was so suboptimal that I have, I would have to wait until Friday night at 10 PM when the clusters were clear. So I could run my code so it could be finished by Saturday morning. So because at Friday night, no one's no, no one in the right mind would be writing code and executing code. So I'm like, okay, well, the classes are clear during that time. I can just run it during that time. It should work, right? Um, but uh, but yeah, I I pushed, I did the best I could, right? Um, made friends. I I I emailed Jeff Weiner saying, Jeff, Jeff was the CEO at the time. Uh, saying, Jeff, I am doing this rotation thing. I just wanted to give a shout out to my manager <laughs> who was giving me a chance to do this thing. Um, I did whatever I could to just kind of stay in the game as long as possible and to take up projects as much as possible, right? Um, and uh, I think in hindsight, at that point, well, one, I, I, didn't, I don't know where the energy reserves came from. I wasn't tired at all. I, I could do this. I didn't feel like I was tired at all. Um, but in hindsight, I look at it and I think maybe I wasn't, why I wasn't tired was because I knew that I was giving everything I had, right? No stone unturned. I gave everything I had and I was running the most beautiful race that I could run in this life, right? Um, I felt like this was a moment where you can look back and you can, in 15, 20 years, you can look at that moment and like succeed or fail. You know, in that moment, you stood on your feet and you stood to the tallest potential that you could have as a human being, right? And succeed or fail, like, I was proud of that, right? So you, you just keep pushing. Um, and so, but it turned out pretty well. Like I think I ended up pretty, getting pretty good at Hadoop, Pig, Hive, and Command Line by month four or five of my rotation. And so in October of 2017, I had a chance to interview again <laughs> for data science. They liked me, so they wanted to interview me again a third time. And, uh, you know, the interview was there. I talked to Shin about it. We had a meeting and, and Shin, Shin, you know, I think two days before the, the interview, he was like, you're ready, Jimmy, right? And uh, I remember the gall I had, I don't know, maybe I was so focused that I didn't really care, but I, I told him verbatim, like, look, Jen, I, I, don't, I don't really care what level you hire me at. You can hire me at associate, you can hire me at a janitor, data, so I don't, I don't care, right? But you hire me and you give me a year on your team and I will be the data scientist the life of which you have never seen, right? <laughs> I said that verbatim to his face. I don't know what I was thinking. I think I was just so focused on achieving my goal, right? Um, but, but so he said, all right, give it a chance. And he gave me a chance. And, and I also met with my manager, Rich, and I told him, Hey man, I'm doing this again. I'm trying my third time, um, to become a data scientist and to transfer again. And he, he sat me down and he told me, look to me, this is your third time doing this. I, I'll let you do it. Right. Cause I believe in letting you pursue your goal, but I don't want someone on my team who doesn't want to be here. Right. So, and that's completely fair for him. And we have a great relationship today. I still think he's one of the greatest managers I've ever had, right? Um, but at the time it was scary, right? This is it. Like there was no safety net, like this is it, right? Um, so I, I did everything I could to prepare for this interview. I, I reached out to all the data science friends I'd made in the last year. I asked them to give me mock interviews, right? Give me product interviews, right? I went on to hacker rank and leak code, did a hundred SQL questions, right? Uh, I went a hundred R coding question. I went through all my old problem sets, right? from you know, CS algorithms and all these courses I'd taken, uh, product interviews, I would stare at LinkedIn, the product, right? And ask myself, how would I make that better? And I would just type answers to myself, right? I had this stack of paper that I printed out. I would just read it over and over again. Because I didn't know the product. I didn't work on the product, right? Um, but that's how you get, you have to have product intuition to be able to do these jobs, right? And then I had my data science friends and my classmates quiz me on stats, right? Just deriving things. How do you interpret p-values? What are p-values, right? Um, how do you set up an unbiased experiment? All these things. Right. Studied my ass off for the interview, took the interview again, aced the interview, got the job. First HR to engineering, one of the first HR engineering transfers in the history of LinkedIn. I remember I broke down crying when I got the news and it was like 
yeah, uh, it was it was like the culmination of everything I had done, I think, in the last four, four and a half years. And that, to me, cemented in my mind that if you work hard and you are persistent, right, you will get it eventually, right? So, yeah, that was uh, the journey to data science, right? That's the first half, right? So I had achieved my goal, uh, four and a half years getting there. Um, but but I, I became a data scientist, right? But that was not the end. That's the beginning, right? Because now you're a data scientist. Now, now you have this title, data scientist. You're expected to be a data scientist. And I realized very quickly, I was a very small fish in a very, very big pond. Still feel that way, I think, right? Um, so 2018, the transition is very rough, right? So if you think about HR, great place to work. But I think if it's safe to say that it's a primarily a place, it's an EQ environment, right? EQ focused environment, right? The data science domain I felt was a very IQ focused environment, right? And I was not, that shift culturally was really tough for me, right? Um, definitely I was not technically equipped enough um, to handle, I think all the initial requests that were coming to me as a data scientist, like a full-fledged data scientist. Um, in hindsight, when I was doing my rotation, right? Um, I had two mentor data scientists that I could come to and it was very task driven, right? But, and so you, you kind of just get an assignment and you do it, right? But now you are the front facing data scientist working with product partners, engineering, marketing, right? To guide business decisions, right? And I was still in a very like execution mentality, right? Where I was um, just expected for people to give me tasks and just do them. So I wasn't a very good partner, right? So not very technically strong, not very good partner, technically very challenging environment, right? And the team product that I was working on was in a tough spot, right? Um, I think the other thing I'll say is that I think culturally is very tough, right? So working in finance and then working in HR, and I, I grew up in America, right? So culturally, I'm used to working with most people who are also from America, right? We grew up here, right? But when I moved to data science, it was very diverse, very international environment. Um, oftentimes, I was the only American on the team, right? So culturally, it was also tough for me to adjust to that as well, right? Um, in hindsight, probably one of the best things I've ever experienced, right? Because I got a chance to experience what it was like for other people to come to the States and be in this completely new environment and having to fight through that. And I got to experience that on easy mode, right? So I, to me, when I, because when I left work and I went home, hey, all my friends are still here, my parents are still here, right? But I realized, I came to realize that my colleagues, now friends, many of them, don't have that luxury. And so I admire what they, I've learned to admire and respect what they do to be able to risk all that and to come to this new place and to, to fight and make a mark on, on, on this world, right? So I respect that a lot, right? And I learned that from doing this transfer to this sort of very international environment, right? Um, but uh, everything was really tough, right? Uh, I, 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 and, and, and I guess I responded to this situation by working like even harder, like I would work, I would wake up at eight and I'd work until 2 a.m. And then I, there was no, no concept of weekends, no concept of Thanksgiving. Like you just, you just work. That's all you did. Right. Um, but I, I felt like no matter what I did, it, it didn't amount to anything. Um, and I think that was a function of just not in hindsight, that was a function of me, not just giving me enough time to grow. Right. Um, me coming in thinking, oh, I'm this hotshot kid, you know, HR to data science, I should be able to do this. No, you got to give yourself time to grow. Right. Um, so I had a lot of self-doubt that I could do the job. I went down into a tailspin, right? And yeah, I just felt like no matter what I did, it wouldn't, wouldn't, wasn't good enough. I, I, it was like almost like a learned helplessness situation, right? And I, I started to stop caring and I was angry. I would break down in tears from time to time. Thank God my wife stayed with me. Like, thank you, honey, for sticking with me through those shitty times, right? Um, and to go from someone who was like, I believed in my journey and I believed what I did. And I had done this, I thought amazing thing of going from HR to data science, going from that to someone who didn't believe in himself, didn't have self-confidence. Basically it shook me to my core. It cracked the core of who I was. I, the, the belief that no matter what you can work hard and you can become strong. Right. Um, it really made me question that it shook that foundation very strong. Um, so I, at least I had the wherewithal to at least the self-awareness to realize, okay, maybe, um, that was, maybe I just need a change of environment. Let me try that, right? So I transferred to another data science team. Um, but the problem with this is just because you transfer to a team doesn't mean that you're, ooh, bam, like 100% brand new, right? You're still recovering from that breakdown, right? And it was a new world, um, but I was, at that point, I didn't really care. I just wanted to get out, right? 
And so even though this is new world, you, when you're in this new world, you have to prove yourself, right? You have no reputation. You have to start over. It's neutral. It's not positive. It's just neutral. So you have to prove yourself still. But I was still lacking in performance just because I was still recovering from that previous experience. Um, but I, I was lucky to join, I think, a, very, a team that functioned in a very structured way. It was more like data engineering focused, right? So you had very task oriented, not as uh, thought leadership, which I lacked at the time, right? Um, and so I, I got to grow in that role a little bit more. So 2018, man, lots of crashing and burning. And in hindsight, again, I told you, man, that was 100% worth it because it taught me a lot about myself and it changed my life perspective a lot too, right? Which I'll get into a little bit later. Um, so 2019, uh, I said, all right, 2019, I was like, okay, enough is enough. I began to change the narrative in my head back to positive. I'm like, okay, just, just persist one day at a time, stick through it. I remember in 2019, I started singing in my car again, which I hadn't done for like almost a year because of my experiences in data science. I was so negative, right? I remember it was like on a Saturday, I was driving from the hospital after getting eye drops from my eye infection and I was singing like Backstreet Boys or something like that. Um, and I was like, oh, I, I hadn't felt positive in a while, right? Um, it was uh, two months late, but as, as the one thing that's consistent, I think in any life is if you stick up with something long enough, Sure, you're not going to grow super fast, but you're going to learn something. You're going to be better today than you were like a year ago if you just stick with it, even if you just do a little bit every day, right? So I delivered my first, I guess, technically impressive project, right? My first data pipeline, um, but I delivered it two months late. <laughs> Classic, right? Um, but I began to realize, you know, like I was beginning to survive. I was beginning to perform. Like I was like, okay, I can, I can kind of do this. I mean, I'm not, I'm not the best, right? But I, I'm all right. I'm all right, right? And I learned, I think from here is, your job is what you do, it's not who you are. I think for the longest time, I, I, had, I had intertwined with my identity with what I did so much that it took me a long time to separate that. Because if you think about all the way back in January, 2013, all I ever did was just work towards this goal of becoming a data scientist. So this is literally who I was, right? And now all of a sudden it's like, no, it's not. It's just a job, it's what you do, right? So this took me time to integrate into my psyche, right? Um, and I, so it started to trend up. Uh, Pilot married my girlfriend of eight years at the time, right? In July of 2019, um, uh, definitely highlight of my life. Um, I'm only allowed to say that though. I can't say anything else. Uh, <laughs> fall of winter 2019, mindset definitely trending positive. And I was starting to deliver as expected, right? And thank you again to, this, the, to the team that allowed me time to grow, right? Uh, and, to gave, and gave me good structure and a good environment. Uh, and life had a broader perspective, right? So... 2019, right? Uh, becoming competent steadily, right? Shifting psyche away from being work as my personal identity, right? Um, okay, 2020, March 2020, I delivered on three key projects. The first is a two layer clustering exec metric algorithm thing that I did, right? The second was a LinkedIn ecosystem COVID dashboard. Because if you think about COVID hit in March of 2020 ish, right? And every website was being affected, LinkedIn included, right? And we wanted to understand how was it affecting our metrics? So I was able to put together a dashboard based on my pipelining skills, based on my Excel skills, based on my communication skills, did really well there. And uh, spending time on this sort of engineering heavy team got me actually pretty good at engineering. Who would have thought, right? Um, and so I set up this, my first uh, training. I built a training for this course, which I think is still being used uh, to this day, uh, which is great. Um, and so I kind of deliver on three key projects and. In, so I'm doing well, right? I'm actually starting to deliver on projects and actually am su surviving, right? And May of 2020, hey, remember my master's I started in 2013? I finished, right? Seven years, right? Um, I made the push to finish because they told me that if I didn't finish in seven years, my classes from 2013 would have expired. So I would have had to take them again, right? I still remember submitting my, my packet, my, my, uh, my cohort form, and the professors, they, they, I think they looked at it and like, what? What the hell, dude? You, you went through like three different cohort changes. Um, my last class that I ever took was Introduction to Python and SQL, <laughs> which is the greatest thing ever. The reason why it's great is one, I, sorry, Professor Bremer, I never showed up to class, um, maybe once or twice. Um, but it's when I took the midterm, took the final, Googled everything, did great, right? But the funniest thing was, so if you started cohort 2013, San Jose State, you had to take SAS, S-A-S, right? Which I think is a language that they use in banking, but it's not really a primary focus in more tech companies like Google and LinkedIn, Facebook, right? And so finally in 20, 2020, they introduced Python and SQL into the curriculum and they retire SAS as a course. And I was dreading, dreading taking SAS. Like that was the last course. And then the, the final quarter that I, or the semester that I decided to take Python and SQL, right? Or um, yeah, Python and SQL, they allowed me to substitute that class for SAS. So I'm like, ha, 
I survived. I did not take SAFs, right? Uh, and so I think in August of 20, so that was fun, graduated, right? Um, and in August of 2020, I surfaced once more on the business side as a data scientist. So if you think about my first role uh, way back in 2017, 2018, that was sort of a partnership role to the business side. Didn't do well there because I didn't, I wasn't a thought partner. I was more like just like a data person puller thing, right? Went into engineering, uh, data engineering-ish team, right? Uh, learned pipelining work, right? Before surfacing, so I, I, learning pipeline work and then building up my confidence on that side, right? And then now I'm at this point in, in, in August of 2020, I was at this point where it was like, okay, I'm pretty good now on the technical side, much stronger than I was two years ago, three years ago, right? And I, I think I have pretty strong communication skills. So it might make sense to try the partnership side one more time. Um, and I had a chance to, to join another team and actually function as a partner again to product and engineering, right? Representing data scientists. Um, October, 2020, I got promoted, right? Didn't get fired, right? I got promoted, right? Um, it was a very lengthy process, but, um, but again, it just still holds true. Stick with it, perseverance. You will get there. Don't give up, right? Uh, I really do believe that, right? Um, so 2020 was reaping the rewards really of sticking it out and still building competency still, right? Um, January, 2021 comes along and I begin teaching an online class in data analytics, right? Giving back to community. I love teaching, right? Uh, it's really fun. Vice a teacher too. Um, and then really starting to deliver on data science projects, right? The stats knowledge coming all together, my familiarity with LinkedIn tech stack, my communication skills, right? Uh, I designed a pretty innovative A-B test that got executive level visibility um, in my team that I had joined. Um, I, and I co-wrote an internal framework doc for other data scientists. Uh, Amon, if you're out there, this is the reverse experiment doc that we're talking about here, right? Um, and I became an exceeds performer in data science. At least my manager told me I was um, pretty recently. My previous team's manager. I, I just moved to a new team, like I think two, three months ago, but my previous team manager told me I was an exceeds performer, right? Um, and I, I wanted to try uh, one more different product. So in December of 2021, um, I transitioned, I made the decision to transition to the new team, which I work currently now on the feed, right? Uh, content experience, as we call it. Um, and, but this time I had a few teams to choose from, I think, because I had a, a pretty strong reputation in data science at this point, um, at least in some things. Um, so 2021 is uh, developing strong um, data science, strong expertise and a reputation in data science. And uh, here I am, 2022, I made it. <laughs> so uh, real quick, I'll just share with you some life learnings that I got from this entire journey. Um, I think the first is that with perseverance, you can achieve anything. Honestly, I believe that. Um, but it's a tool. It's a potent tool. But you got to think about the cost, right? I think, I guess but what I mean by that is everyone is, some people are, are naturally better at some things than others, right? I think that's the case. And that's kind of like the, 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 the hand of cards that you're dealt at life, right? Now, the hand of cards you're dealt and how well you play that hand, those are two different things. You cannot control the hand that you are dealt, right? You can control how well you play the game and how many times you want to play the game, right? So maybe for me, I don't know, if I did my PhD in math, could I get it? Yeah, with perseverance, probably. Maybe it'll take me like 10 years to do, right? As opposed to somebody else. Maybe it'll only take them four years. So then it's not, I don't think, it, so then, then if the question is, or at least in my head, then if the question is, um, if you can do pretty much anything with perseverance, what is it that you want to do? Right? So that's where the cost part comes. Right? Any goal, I think, if you set your mind to it and you work at it, you will achieve it. But then you got to consider your strengths. How much time do you have? How much time do you want to invest? Right? Everything has a cost. But with per perseverance, I think you can achieve anything. Right? Failing and being bad at something is part of the journey to mastery. 100% agree. I was um, failed a bunch of interviews, as you can see, right? Uh, these are just the internal interviews. I tried externally too, it didn't work out. Uh, uh, even when I joined data science, I was, I, I still say I wasn't the world's best data scientist. Okay, I was not a very good data scientist for the first year or two, right? But you stick with it, right? But it's part of the journey to mastery. Am I a good data scientist now? I think I'm, I'm all right. I can, I can I'm all right. I, I'm, I, I can hang in there, right? I can, I can do what I can, right? Um, and of course, I think this one always rings true, but hard work doesn't amount to much if you don't believe in yourself right? If you're just going through the motions, right? But in your heart of hearts, you don't really believe that you can achieve your goal. I don't think you're going to get there, right? Or it'd be very hard to get there because but the thing is though, like if you believe that you can get it, 
right? And then you go for it and you fail. It hurts so much. It hurts so much, right? But you have to, you need both. You need to work hard and you have to believe in yourself. Otherwise, you know, that's, that's the combination, right? But with belief comes that pain, right? Because you believe that you can do it and you don't, but you got to keep going, right? So that's me in a nutshell. I've been talking for an hour now. Uh, I'm going to open it up to Q&A and uh, Nathan, hopefully you can pop up on the screen and help me out here. But thank you everyone for listening and for your time. I really do appreciate it. So. Yeah, thank you, Jimmy. And so if anybody has any questions, if you're on Zoom, put them in that Q&A tab. Um, if you're not on Zoom, put them in the chat and we'll get them on the Q&A tab. Uh, before we go into questions and so I can give people time to, um, to ask them. And I already see one person put a question in chat. Javier, um, if you could put that into the Q&A tab, um, that would just help us keep everything organized. So um, before we... Uh, go into q and A. I I do want to share next week's webinars because I know uh, Fatima, who is our logistics person, she would um, be a little upset with me if I didn't. So, um, so first uh, next week, and maybe I can get Jimmy off of the shared screen as well. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, go ahead. Come and oh, do I, it. It just, you know, it automatically yeah. moved over okay. for me. Yeah. Um, so next week we have... Um, and I'm hoping I'm sharing the right screen. Can Jimmy, can you see the Bento ML? I do see Bento ML. Yes. Correct. All right. So next week we have, and I'm again, hoping I'm saying her name correctly because I've only met her once, uh, Qin Tran uh, with us June 21st at noon uh, Pacific. And it's going to be um, uh, just a talk that uses Bento ML to create um, an ML powered prediction service. Um, so this is going to be more like a tutorial. Um, and Qin, she comes from, uh, she's a data science intern at Ocelot, but she's written over 150 data science articles on towards data science. So um, if you're in the, if you're constantly reading about data science, you've probably heard of towards data science and she gets over 100,000 views per month. Um, and so we're, and I know our internal team is really excited um, about this talk. And then also, um, we have Christian Walker, who's going to be uh, doing a tutorial on trend analysis using unstructured data from Wall Street bets. And we may not all want to look at Wall Street right now, but, but um, again, it's going to be a tutorial style talk. So we're going to be learning something new. And Christian has a PhD in theoretical physics, really smart guy. Um, and he actually specialized in um, intelligent algorithms for unstructured data and text. So another tutorial that we're also very excited for. So with that, um, I think we can go into Q&A and I think I um, also, when I can find my menu here, um, satisfied Fatima's requirements for me. <laughs> um, uh, so um, I have the tab here. Um, the first one is from Vivek and I saw this one uh, at the very start. I think Jimmy, even maybe before you started talking, Okay. Um, Beck wants to know if LinkedIn's hiring. <laughs> <laughs> We're always hiring. <laughs> uh, hiring for ourselves, hiring for others. Um, I believe so. I mean, check the job boards. I haven't looked in a while, but I'm, I'm sure we're hiring. Um, yeah. Yeah, so check um, it out. Yeah. And then another one that is from your introduction uh, from, I think it's going to be one of our live streams. Sure. Um, what is, what's your ESFJ score for each category? That's, that's important, oh, which I'm not sure if you uh, remember that. So I remember the E and the I part. I'm definitely like 70% E, 30% I. Uh, it used to be like 90, 10, but I've definitely balanced out as I've gotten mm -hmm. a little older. Let's put it that way, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't remember the other three. Uh, All right. It's been a while, but I, I, I do remember doing the test a few times throughout like my 20s. I haven't done it in my 30s yet. I'm, I'm 31 for those who don't know, right? But um, uh, I don't, I always do ES, I, I'm always ESFJ. It always pops up throughout my 20s every time I took the test. Maybe if I, uh, it'll change if I do it now, but I don't remember the scores. Sorry. Yeah. Good question though. Thank you. <laughs> and then I'm, and I'm hoping I'm saying your name correctly. Is it Aurora? Um, when you were not doing well during, during your first year as a data scientist, um, how did you communicate with management to avoid losing your job? And I'm going to kind of twist that a little bit too. <laughs> did you communicate with management at all um, during that first year that, that you, when you were kind of struggling a little? Maybe I should have, I don't know. I didn't. Um, I, I did what, uh, I did what I thought was best, which increasingly in hindsight, wasn't the best. <laughs> and I just kind of soldiered on and did the best I could. 
Um, I think the other thing that's really good is uh, LinkedIn's culture is pretty compassionate, right? So they gave me time overall to grow, I think. And I know that sounds kind of biased coming from me, but I do sincerely believe that. It's one of the reasons why I've been here for a long time, right? Um, but no, I didn't, I didn't do that. I should have though. That's a fair question. Yeah. I'm, I mean, okay. First of all, PSA, I may be here speaking, but I am not, I'm just one individual. Okay. Just my story and all its flaws and in all its successes and failures. I just, I just want to share with you. That's all. Right. I, I know my approach may not have been optimal, right. Uh, in, in a lot of things, but, uh, it, it is what happened. Right. And I can only share from that. And hopefully you can either take something from that or learn from that. If, learn from my mistakes. Right. So, yeah. Okay. But, and then, Javier, um, do you, and again, this isn't, I'm not saying the exact question, but do you have any wisdom for anybody older than 40 who wants to become a data scientist? I think it can be done. I think there are some folks actually at LinkedIn, um, above 40, as you, the terminology, that are in data science now, right? We have, a, I think, I've, I've seen it being done, right? And there are folk who, I believe this gentleman had a very illustrious career, um, um, but uh, He's there and he's doing the best he can, right? So, okay. And then, uh, Jonathan, do you believe that it would still require the same drive to achieve, or was that a first quartile of growth problem? And I'm I'm going to assume that's referring to your first year. Yeah, I think it's I think it's the latter. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it's the latter. I think now I, I'm assuming achieve by achieve you mean like getting into data science, right? Uh, I, I think now it's much more structured. Um, yeah, I think now overall it's much more structured. I think I see data science programs. I see a lot of my friends that take data science programs and they come out and they take some sort of like data analyst job and then eventually curve their career into a data science role, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I, I did see a comment on uh, in the chat. Uh, Suma is 50 and moved into the field now. There you so, go. Represent Suma. Congratulations. Maybe you and um, who was it? And Javier, maybe you guys can connect on LinkedIn and and there you go reach out <laughs> yeah, yeah make those connections yeah um and then an anonymous attendee um are there similarities between hr and data analytics science or engineering i am making a similar transition from business manager into this space uh okay so i'll, I'll answer i'm not sure about this do you mean which way are you going i guess is my first question but I'll, I'll answer the first question which i think will answer your second um I, I think so i think increasingly so um the two things that I find different, number one, are what questions you're trying to answer, right? Um, are you trying to solve more organizational HR problems or are you trying to solve more product or maybe machine learning uh, at scale related problems? In terms of the questions that you ask, um, I think it requires the same kind of thinking. I, again, you're just solving different problems. Second thing that I will call out is the scalability, different tools, right? Uh, maybe in HR, you can, um, you can be a very successful HR analytics professional with SQL, Excel, maybe R, Python, Tableau, right? But in the data science side, often, at least in the product side, um, especially with these websites, you're dealing with such a large volume of data, right? Um, that these tools that you have sometimes can't uh, keep up. So you have to pick up additional skills, right? Um, so I think, it, it, I think when I made the journey, it was more like, how do I grow more as a data scientist? But in hindsight, looking back and looking at the industry nowadays, my, I'm of the opinion that it comes down to what problems you want to solve, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Okay. And then Michelle, I am struggling with my technical interview skills. Mm -hmm. What do you recommend to improve those skills? Practice. <laughs> <laughs> Always practice. Always practice. And, and so I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> what was the name of the candidate? Sorry. Michelle. Uh, Michelle. Uh, Michelle, I'm sorry that if that comes off as a bit uh, brazen, if you will. Um, but I think that you can do it. Heck, man, if I can just hit the goal with a hammer until it breaks, right? If just practice, be creative, right? Do all the practice questions online, hit all the, the questions on lead code, right? Ask your friends in industry to interview you, give them mock interview, right? Take those mock interviews, right? Just keep at it. And uh, the second thing is remind yourself why you're doing it, right? Uh, do you have a strong reason for persisting through all of this, right? Those two things. Okay, and then another anonymous question, Sure. or anonymous attendee, uh, what programming languages are the most commonly used in data science? Is Python used a lot? Python increasingly so. Um, if you learn R, I would encourage you to learn Python. I'm talking to myself as well, because I still use, <laughs> use R, but <laughs> um, R, Python. So you need to, so R and Python to manipulate, analyze, visualize data. 
and you need SQL to be able to pull the data, right? Um, at least from the analytics side. Um, I think it also depends on what kind of data scientist you want to be, right? Uh, data science is a very broad title. I like to partner with business to analytics, right? So I'm living in SQL, R, Python, Excel, Tableau, and any of the bigger data tool stuff that I need to learn, right? It's, I think once you learn one, you can kind of pick it up. But there are other, I guess, types of data scientists that are, that are more focused on the theory side, right? They focus on the mathematics or maybe on the tooling side, building tools for other data scientists, right? Um, yeah. But yeah, R and Python. If you had to start somewhere, I'd say Python. Um, if you had to pick up a second, I'd, actually, if you had to pick up two, Python and SQL, those two. And both of those, plenty of resources on there. Or at Coding Dojo. <laughs> data Science Dojo. We have courses. Um, mm. Data <laughs> Science Dojo. Sorry, I said the wrong one. My bad, Nathan. That's all right. Okay. I yeah. forgive you. It's all um, good. Um, all right. Um, but yeah, we've noticed too, Python is just growing like crazy within data yeah. science. But yeah. um, Data Science Dojo's opinion is learn one language first, get good at it, and then, and then make the switch if you want. That is also Jimmy's opinion. Yeah. I'm glad we're alive, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So, uh, Natalie, um, based off of your experience, is there a difference in getting a master's in data analytics or mm -hmm. certificate? And she is looking to get an, into an analytics role and um, is in a similar position that you were in in 2013. Sure. So I wouldn't classify it as master's versus certificate so much as I would classify as how much time are you putting into this, right? The master's, the certificate, anything you do is a medium by which you spend hours practicing the skill, right? And the longer you spend hours practicing the skill, the better you'll get at it, right? Now that's the skill part. That's the part you need to pass the interview, right? There's a second part, which is like, how do you get the interview, right? Um, I definitely think that either, I think the master's carries weight. I think that's certificate plus maybe some side projects on the side carry weight. I think there's some combination of certificates uh, plus side projects, plus maybe a job in an analyst role where you're demonstrating that you're being proactive and, and doing different projects. I think that carries weight as well, right? Um, but at the end of the day with these more, I guess, technical interviews, they really do evaluate, hey, do you really know how to do this? So they will ask you questions, hey, write the SQL query or how would you do this in Python? Or you know, what are, how do you set up an experiment, right? So um, it, it comes down to, uh, skill at the end of the day, I think, right? And you can get those skills through a master's, you can get those skills through a certificate, right? But also be conscious of how much time you spend working on those skills. Because as they say, right, the longer you spend on it, the better you get, right? Put in the, put in the work. <laughs> put in the work, put in the work. Again, bias perspective, right? That's my approach, right? But um, uh, that's what has worked for me, so. Okay, and I'm seeing a, question that we already answered. So I'm gonna skip that, sorry, Javier. Um, uh, another anonymous attendee, I've heard a lot of data science jobs involve data cleaning and not as much analysis and machine learning. Is that true from your experiences? Also, thank you so much for your presentation. It was very motivating. Thank so, you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your time. Uh, what was the name of the candidate, sorry? Uh, it was anonymous. Oh, anonymous. Well, thank you, anonymous. Not that yeah. anonymous, but thank you, anonymous. Uh, heart to you too. Um, uh, shoot, what was the question? My bad, dude. <laughs> I got distracted honest. by that heart. Distracted, anonymous. I was like, anonymous? Like the hacking company? So, anonymous so they, they want to know, um, is data cleaning? Um, oh, got it. Well, I've, I've heard a lot. I'll just repeat it. I've yeah, heard go for it. Yeah. Science jobs involved data cleaning and not as much analysis and machine learning. Is that true from your experiences? Um, yes, more than no, but it, it also depends, right? Um, if we look at it from a data life cycle end to end, right? Data is produced, then it has to be cleaned in some way, and then it has to be analyzed, and then it has to be um, presented, right? It, in general, I'd say it's true, right? And I think that's actually really good because um, garbage in, garbage out, right? You can have the prettiest analysis, the pretty visualizations, but if you don't have clean data, then it doesn't mean anything. I think the second thing is as a data scientist, right? At least my style of data scientist, your product is not like a widget that you build or an app that you build. Your product is an insight, right? And a good insight is something that's gonna inform good decision or to inform the right decision at the right time, right? That insight to be a good insight needs to be founded on clean, as much clean data as possible. Or if it's not clean, then you need to be aware of where it's not clean. So that when you're making your conclusions, right? You know how to caveat, right? Um, 
I think that is, so, but to answer your question directly, I think that's more true than false. There are some teams, I mean, it also really depends. I mean, some data sets are super messy. Some are super clean. It also depends on like how accurate you want your, your answer to be for the question. Like, do we want this to the 0.001% you know, accuracy or do we just want a direction like so that we can make a yes or no decision, right? Um, all that informs how much time you spend cleaning and how much time you spend analyzing and how, or how much time you spend putting a presentation together, right? So, yeah. All right. And then, oof, I don't know how to say this person's full name, so I'm going to shorten it to Kang. So I'm really sorry. <laughs> um, um, so, uh, what are the what what are the courses you would recommend for someone starting out? Oh, that's a broad question. There's, there are so many out there. courses. I mean, okay, so I mean, I think the best. <laughs> wow, uh, that's a. I wish I could clarify more, but it's okay. Okay, so I think the most important thing is to pick up skills, all right? So from the from skill side, what I mean, I think one of the most important things, SQL. Okay, there's a ton of resources online. Start learning SQL, right? Start learning Python, one of the two. Mm -hmm. but actually, ideally both of those, right? It doesn't matter where you come in walks of life. A lot of data science interviews I've seen have those two things, okay? Mm -hmm. Um... If you're talking about a master's, um, you could do a master's in analytics or data science. That's also a place to, to start, right? Um, certificates, that's a place to test the water, see if you like it, right? If you like it, you can do another certificate. If you are coming from, this is why I need a lot of detail, but if you're coming from a position where you're in a role right now or your job and you wanna start, then start learning those skills on the side, keep your income, right? Use that money, invest in yourself if you can, right? Um, and then take your learnings and then apply it to the job. Right, because then what will happen is then you'll, you'll have these bullet points in your resume that you can talk about in your next interview, right? That, hey, here's your tangible experiences that I have, right? I, without more context, I, I don't really know how to answer. Yeah, it's a very it's broad hard, question. It's hard to answer when you don't it's know the question. background, right? <laughs> Sorry, yeah, yeah. But, but King, coming from like the sales perspective, come talk to us. <laughs> uh, we can help sure. you out. Um, uh, all right. Um, and before, really quick before Cameron, your question is next up, but um, Jimmy, what was the, what was the title of the book that you shared earlier? Uh, I think it's introduction to elements of statistics. Let me grab it. I have it right here. One side. I'll be right back. Yeah. Mary is saying introduction to statistical learning, second edition. We'll see if that's right. Okay. It is called an introduction to statistical, statistical learning with applications in Python. <laughs> yes, uh, Mary A, that's correct. There is a seventh uh, printing. It's free online. That's correct. Mary's crushing it in the chat, by the way. She's been like summarizing all your points and everything. I see that. Thank you. I appreciate that, Mary. Appreciate it. <laughs> all right, Cameron, we're at your question now. And this is a little longer. So, Jimmy, you might want to pull up the Q&A tab just okay. so that. Um, oh, wow. There's a lot of questions. But okay. I will read it out loud. Um, hey, Jimmy, appreciate the time and great story. I come from a molecular biology undergraduate background and worked in clinical data support role for a private healthcare slash biomedical services company, primarily using Excel. Since uh -huh. departing from that position, I have taught myself both SQL and Python to have an edge to land a data analyst position. Respect. I have gotten to a few final interviews, have had feedback that my code is competent, but no luck landing a position. Uh, since then, it's been a boatload of applications on deaf ears, and I'm starting to worry I won't land a position. I know in a professional setting, I would be able to perform and grow as a data analyst, but haven't been afforded the chance even in an entry-level internship position. Any advice is greatly appreciated. Thanks again for your time. I just I want to see everybody's going to grab the book. I think you did. Oh, <laughs> I thought you can grab the, the title. I was like, oh, th thank you, uh, Questy, I believe. Cameron, let me tell you something. You are so close. Let me also tell you this. It took me 33 interviews to get my first job. <laughs> Maybe I was a bad interviewer, right? <laughs> I made it to six final rounds and I, I, I didn't get offers until the sixth one. Um, and I think it was the sixth one I got it because I called and I followed up. And I'm like, all right, these, if these companies are going to ghost me, then I might as well call them back and see who gets back to me. So at least I can get some feedback. Hey, what can I do better, right? What's the worst they're going to do? They're going to hang up on me? Fine, I don't care, right? Um, Cameron, you're very close. Uh, based on your story, you have experience working with this data. You've taught yourself SQL and Python, and you've gone to final rounds, man. That's, you're very close. I'd say keep going. Um, 
I will say this, job hunt is ruthless. Um, it's a heartless, it's, 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 it's rough. It's because it's like, you're putting yourself out there. You're, you're putting all this work into yourself. So here, here I am, I'm ready. And you don't even get responses. Like that is the hardest thing to go through, man. And I remember, geez, this is another tangent here, but I also have helped people in this category. But I think the best thing I can say is like, do your best to separate who you are and your self-worth from the responses or lack of responses that you're getting in your job hunt, right? Um, don't let it grind you down too much, right? Do your best not to let it grind you down too much. But I'm hearing your story, um, Cameron, you're close. Keep shooting, man. You'll get it. You're very close, right? You're, you're at this. Many people don't even make it that far, like to the part where they're going final rounds and, and getting rejected at final rounds. That in and of itself, like I say it, you know, it may, I don't know if this comes off the wrong way, but like you should hold your head high for getting to that point. That is right at the front door. You just need one job. And the, the, the cool thing is the longer you fight for this, right? Um, once you get that job, I think the better performer you will be because you will know how hard you had to fight to get that first job that you will be very motivated to do very well, right? Which will then, once you get that first one, then it's like you build your network within your company. Obviously people leave and move between companies. And as they leave, they pull you along and say, hey, I have an opening uh, on my team. Do you want to come along and work? And it makes interviewing a lot easier, right? So yeah, you got up. this, man. Yeah. Up. yeah, come on, push. <laughs> All right, and then... Um... Aiden, I can sort of answer your question, because, but I'm, of course, biased. Um, who should I use for data science, Python, or R? Come talk to Data Science Dojo. We'll prop it up. <laughs> but, but, Jimmy, do you have any, maybe there was, uh, when you were kind of, you know, doing things on your own, was there like a specific YouTuber that maybe you watched some tutorials on that you can remember or... So not at the time. So when I was doing this, no, the, I don't think YouTube education either. It was getting bigger at the time and I wasn't aware of it or it didn't exist. And mm -hmm. I, I had not, I didn't, I didn't use YouTube. Okay. I do it now. Uh, sometimes I was on, uh, I did a video if you on like Bayesian statistics. Like I used mm -hmm. it for that. Right. Um, very useful. They explain it very clearly. Mm -hmm. Thank you to these people who put out the time to do it. Right. Um, if the question is, uh, do I start with R or Python? Right. Uh, speaking as an R user, I would start with Python. <laughs> so the reason I say that is because R is more, um, I think more academic in nature. Um, yeah. With Python, increasingly, I think the two functions are merging, but the one thing with Python um, that, well, there's a few things with Python. I think that syntax is a little bit easier, like mm -hmm. um, very indentation friendly, or yeah, it's indentation driven, not as syntaxy driven. Mm -hmm. um, and the second thing is you can code things in production. You can work with engineers, push models, production in Python, right? So it's an all around tool that's mm -hmm. uh, picking up steam. Right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And and Aiden, we have free tutorials on R and Python. So um, if that's something you're looking for, shoot me an email, or um, or go go to our website. You know, contact us somehow, and I can share those tutorials with you. Um, all right. Moving on. Um, Danielle, and I believe Danielle is from one of our live streams. What suggestions do you have for those who have just completed a data science certificate? to enter the field with no professional experience. Um, mm. My advice is practice, but. <laughs> I, would, I would echo that, um, Nathan. I, would, I, I don't think <clears throat> the mentality of if certificate then job is not necessarily, um, in my opinion, maybe the, the best approach. A, a better mindset would be, okay, certificate give, gives me foundation, gives me introduction, gives me a good grounding in these things, right? Let me go try to find something that I can apply my skills to. Side projects, Kaggle is really good. Um, data sets you can find online, right? Uh, if you're working in a job today, see if you can take that knowledge and apply it to what you're doing to make something better, right? The nice thing about data analysis is that it's ubiquitous. Every, every industry fundamentally, most industries fundamentally have data and they have questions that the business want answered, right? And then if you just use your analytics skills that you picked up from your certificate, you can bridge the gap, answer the questions with the data you have, right? Provide value from doing that, right? Build a reputation for yourself and then leverage that career capital to get what you want, right? Um, and, it, and you can apply this to any role. Like even if you're not in an analyst, like an analyst or an analytics role, I was an HR, right? Just be creative, look around, right? Um, but uh, as always stick with it, right? That's my general advice. All right, so uh, the next person asked three questions, but for the sake of time, I'm gonna pick, pick one of them because I think it's something that nobody's asked yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I know this was also posted in chat. So some of these questions may have been answered 
um, no by Mary. If, if they <laughs> um, uh, so thanks for organizing and a big thanks for your time and sharing your story and perseverance are super inspirational. I think there's an emoji in there. Really appreciate it. Um, so I'm choosing question number two. Um, if you want to make the, if you were to make the transition again, what would you do differently? Would you still do a master's in stats versus online courses or boot camps? Um, and it sounds like the coding part was your weakness. How would you strengthen that? Of course, on the job, but got to land the job first, right? Okay. So I actually see the question here. If you were to make the transition, what would you do, do differently? Mm -hmm. I'll answer that two ways. What would I, if I, if I, I would answer that first way is, would you go and change anything? No, because the way I did it gave me the knowledge that I had today so that I could help the people that I can, I'm able to help, right? If I did it a different way, I wouldn't have that knowledge. And of course, if I did it a different way, I'd have different knowledge, but I, I don't play that game. There's no such thing as uh, uh, going back and changing time. And, but if I had to change something differently, um, honestly, I think maybe doing a master's in data science, uh, now that they have them, is a little bit more, uh, more aligned with how I think the data science role is shaping up in general in the industry. The reason I say that is because in stats, a lot of time you're going super deep in the theory, you know, like uh, linear regression, Hessian matrix. How, how does regression work? Matrix calculus, right? Kramer Rao, lower bound. And if the, these things are important, if you want to be like maybe a researcher or you want to work on that side of data science. But if you want to do, for me, if you want it for, for me, right? If you want to do analytics and solve business problems and, you know, maybe do the occasional machine learning model, right? Visualizations in R and Python, influence business decisions with insights. I think a master's in data science should be good. The reason I say that is because it prepare, prepares you at the right level of um, two things. It prepares you at the right level of technical depth. You, you still have to do like, you still have to know like eigenvalues, eigenvectors, linear algebra, right? Mm -hmm. But you're not spending all day proving things and writing things down. The mm -hmm. homework assignments, as I know, are a lot more practical, right? You learn Spark, right? And I think UCSD's uh, data science program I had a friend go through that, right? Um, you learn... Uh, uh, more practical tools that will help you more directly on the job, right? Uh, so, yeah, I think um, if I had to, if I mean, if the question is like, what is the best path forward now? Uh, given that you want to do like more analytics focus, I do a master's in data science, right? Um, online courses, bootcamp work too, but again, it's it's less about what the program offers and more about the time you spend in the role, right? I know those boot camps are very intense, right? But even if you work 24 hours a day for 13 weeks, that's still only 13 weeks or three months, right? Versus someone who's been doing a job for 10 years. There's no way you can compete. The person doing 10 years on the job, eight hours a day has way more experience than you, right? So it's a function of time, which I also learned on my journey, right? I pushed myself too hard at the beginning um, and I burned out, right? But you learn to give yourself time, right? Mm -hmm. um, sound of the coding was a weakness. Yeah, I would say that. How do you strengthen it? practice. <laughs> so, <laughs> there's no, there's no easy way around it. There's no easy way around it. I'm sorry. Um, having said that, there are some really good resources online. You can use leak code to practice. That's leak code is really good. in that there's like interview level, um, uh, coding material, right. Hacker rank is really good as well. I use those two in my interview. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. And I, we have Jimmy, you said you're available until two, right? Mm-hmm. We may go until two. That's okay. <laughs> Let's go. I'm here so, to help. Um, uh, so if anybody, if you, I, I've already see, seen people, you know, jumping in and out. Um, so it sounds like we're going to be here probably for another half hour. So if you do have to leave to go take care of other things, you're not going to hurt our feelings. Okay. Uh, there will be a recording. Um, it'll be a little longer than our other uh, webinars, but um, we will have that up probably sometime early next week. Um, so. Oh, I'm going to butcher this name too. So I'm sorry. I wish they had a class on just how to pronounce names around the world and that'd make my life easier, but I'm going to do my best. Abdaraman. And again, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, thank you for your time today, Jimmy. As someone approaching my upper division, giving, uh, sorry, as someone approaching my upper division, going from computer science to data science bachelors, what would be your advice for taking advantage of my time while studying? Inspired by the way you manage your time throughout your journey. Well, first of all, uh, Abdaraman, I believe is how you pronounce it. I'm sorry again if I butchered the name. Um, <laughs> advice for taking advantage of my time while studying. Huh? Um, how do I interpret that? So advice for taking advantage of my time while studying. Um, I, maybe like, 
while you're in university, build those connections with your professor. Yeah, get that helps. advice on what would they do differently if they were going to enter the um, public sector. Um, and and then go go to those career fairs. Build, career fairs. Yeah, mm. get to know get the know get to know those recruiters. And not everybody at the career fairs like not everybody's a recruiter. Some people are like actual employees that were told to show up. So mm -hmm. um, get to know them too. Um, that's what. Like if I was in college today, that's what at least I would do differently. Yeah. Um, okay. So advice for taking advantage of my time. I mean, just, um, geez, there's so many ways I can take this question. I, I think just if you, okay, from a data science perspective, learn the concepts really well, right? Um, you on the job, you can always look those things up, right? But conceptually, do you understand what's happening? right behind the scenes i think to that end it might be good to at least once get into your head mathematically how an algorithm works right at least for the algorithms that i use i try to my best to do that um uh but uh yeah I, I, i've i've seen so many walks like i the, i'm torn between like taking serious studies there remember my b plus experience right i'm torn between telling you hey take your studies really seriously you know versus it's like no <laughs> uh yeah there's no fun versus like you know it's okay it's just part of who you are you'll figure it out and i and i and then i and then i'm thinking okay what about professionally what have i seen i've seen people come from both paths and converge right um the one thing that i see is consistent though is that if you really it's too, it just comes back i know i'm sounding like a broken record but i want something put a, put a point on it your point a put a point b on that figure out how to get there, right? You can get there fast, you can get there slow, but just keep at it, you'll get there, right? So maybe maybe you do well in your data science undergrad program, uh, Dharman, right? And you do great, but maybe there's a recession, so you can't land a job, and so you land something else, right? But And, and you take this other, other journey through life, right? But the consistent thing is like, if you focus on something, right? I am convinced that you will figure out a way to get there, right? by hook or by crook, you'll figure it out, right? You'll do something, you'll be out of the box, you'll think out of the box, you'll do something that's unconventional, you'll do something you don't even expect to do, right? But ultimately, if you keep that goal in mind, I think you will get there, right? So um, now, of course, a little bit of bias, I, I was a bit of a try hard in school, at least the last two years of my college university life. So yeah, do well in school, that helps, right? Um, uh, but know that life can throw you curveballs, I guess, too, right? So I guess maybe just truly do your best, right? Don't half-ass it, whatever you do, just do your best, live your life. Stand on your fullest potential. Stand to your fullest potential so that you are proud of what you have done, right? All right, and Javier, so I'm going to read the first comment by Javier, and then there is a follow-up one immediately after. So, and Javier, maybe you can talk <laughs> to me after this because I have experience with both of these things. Um, so I know you teach online on a 24 months course, but what do you think about a five-day boot camp? And then immediately following that, he says, uh, sorry, forgot about that forget about that question i think they are not comparable but i think it just depends on like what is your end goal because like you're gonna like a five-day boot camp versus 24 months like what you do in those is gonna probably be a lot different and so what is the goal just to upskill in your current position or is it to become a data scientist so uh, again um you can come talk to me um and, and we can we can talk about your goals and and kind of figure out you know what's best for you um, but, uh, moving on to Marina, um, how do you explain your desire to others to move from an analyst to data scientist? So I think this is referring to, you know, your, your right. coworkers and your leaders and all that. Okay. So how do you explain? Okay. I see. I see. So I think what you do first, um, Marina, right. Is assuming you're an analyst, right. And assuming you're teaching yourself data science on the side, right. You don't, I don't think you first announce your intention, right? Because the chances are if you're an analyst in a role that they don't really work with data scientists, they don't really understand what it is, right? But what you do is you start taking the um, knowledge that you gain from outside, right? And you start applying it to your job. And as long as you're working with data and because data is so ubiquitous, right? Um, you can at least, at the very least, you can automate reporting. That's where it starts, right? Take, you take those coding skills, start to automate that reporting with Python, right? You can do a lot of things with Python. You can send emails to, you know, schedule emails to send, you know, have, have every day, two o'clock, run a cron job, hits the, the SQL server, pulls data, data frame, do some manipulation, right? Send out an email, right? You can do all that and you can just let it run, go get your coffee as it does it, right? Um, so start to automate things, start to do things, right? And then once you start to do things, then you show your manager, hey, here's the value I'm providing, right? Uh, I'm gonna, so, 
here's a problem that I see in the business. And I think we can solve this with machine learning, right? Or with uh, some model, right? Just do it. Don't wait for them to ask you or her to ask you. Just do it, right? And then show them, hey, look, here's the results. Here's, here's why it's good. Can we try that, right? And so you do it. You show them that this thing brings value, right? And then you, you, you build that trust, you build that career capital, and you say, hey, uh, manager, this is something that you know, I'm interested in doing, right? Um, and so it, the, who you are, who have as a manager is also a factor, right? I was lucky. I had a really good manager who was open to me exploring different career venues and even would introduce me to different people to meet, right? Um, but you also have to kind of play that game, kind of figure out where you manage. Like, does your manager want to help you? It's, are they doing it just for themselves? Like, that is a, something you need to read, read the situation, right? Um, and if it's a supportive environment and it works, then work together with that person to grow yourself in this direction, right? Um, and at some point it's like, for me, I had a chance to inter transfer internally and try multiple times, but maybe at some point for you, it didn't, it doesn't work out anymore, Marina. Right. Um, so at that point you're like, okay, well, I have the skills now, right. I've added value to the company. Let me spruce up my resume a bit, apply to a few data analyst job and talk about the work that I did, right. The value that I added. Right. But it's never going to come from your manager. If you want, it, it, unless they're like a data analyst or data scientist role, which, but that's kind of a catch 22 cause you're already there. Right. Uh, if you want, to get there, right? It's going to be take some proactiveness, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And then um, I actually can't see this person's name. So I think it's Haki. I think, sorry. Um, uh, what is considered as good enough when, you know, with Python and SQL as a start? So what is considered good enough? And then I'm actually kind of looking to do more machine learning uh, or machine learning engineering. And side note, your whole story was inspiring to the point that you said that you were at R31. <laughs> uh, um, this I person, know I'm not lying, right? <laughs> uh, uh, they pursued dance professionally for 10 years after uh, they couldn't afford engineering school back then. Hey, professional I dancer. See. That's a pretty cool switch. That's, hey, that's way cool in DDR, I'll tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they'd, they'd probably just destroy us in DDR. I was never good with my feet, so I could never get a high score. <laughs> it's all good. Um, I mean, good enough is, um, what is considered good enough as, as a start? I don't know if I would think of it as a start. I think it was just good enough to, to pass interviews, right? I mean, um, at different, go ahead, Nathan. You were, you were Googling answers for your intro to Python final, weren't you? Yeah, I mean, it was. <laughs> I mean, we were allowed to use Google too, because it was online. So that was after, yeah, yeah it was the last, last course, right? Um, um, and I think different companies have different standards, different companies, uh, some companies are really rigorous on certain things. Some companies aren't really rigorous on the other. That's why that the interview process, the other reason why I say don't take it so personally is because a lot of it is luck, right? You may get an interviewer that doesn't match your skills. You may get a question that doesn't align with your strengths, right? You may get an interviewer that's having a bad day. Maybe you got chewed out by his boss an hour before and wants to take it out on someone, right? Um, the role may fall through the requisition may close because the company doesn't have any more money a lot of other factors and just your own performance. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so take, you know, take your results with a grain of salt, um, but to be good enough, like it depends. Like I've, I do remember some of the interviews I took at the startups, not very rigorous, not as rigorous as the ones I did at, um, at LinkedIn. Right. Um, so it's, uh, I think, yeah, but to answer your question directly, good enough to, to pass interviews, right. To land that job. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, to get to that level is just practice. And of course, the more you practice and the better you get, right? Yeah, and, and sorry, Hakem, your uh, your name got cut off on my Q&A thing. So that's why I pronounced it Haki, but uh, they say, trust me, dancers are bad at DDR too. That's <laughs> <good>. <laughs> I have, there's hope for us, Nathan. <laughs> um, all right, so an anonymous attendee um, is asking, any advice on getting into a uh, master's in data science who has a bachelor's GPA, GPA below 3.0? Um, oh, um, no idea. <laughs> okay. Well, let me tell you this. Um, when I was, I was a C student in math my first few years at university. Uh, it's because I didn't work hard. I didn't try. I was trying to be a professional tennis player. All right. Um, last two years, I pushed myself um, and became a straight A student. Yes, Mary, it's true. Um, I was a straight A minus student, but uh, yeah, I was, I, so my, I think my coming out, my GPA overall, like 3.3, 3.4, I, 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 I know that master's programs can be focused on 
GPA because it's very academic setting, right? Uh, I would, that, so yeah, I'm, what I'm struggling with is like, because it's so academic and it looks, I don't know how, maybe there, I don't know, maybe there are master's programs, so I don't know, but here's some thoughts. Maybe there are some master's programs that look more than just your GPA. Maybe they look at your life situation or your circumstances or maybe side projects, or maybe, maybe you show them that, look, um, this is what, uh, this is what I want to do. Here are the side projects that I've worked on. Here's the experience that I've had since, right? Here's a reason why maybe I didn't do as well in school, right? Um, give them, find a way maybe to give them more context. I do remember one thing when I was about to get admitted into San Jose state, right? Uh, the head of the stats program wrote me an email and he asked me, Hey, Jimmy, you did really well, uh, in your junior and senior years. Why didn't you do, do, do as well in your more simple, like, you know, multivariable calculus course in your first few years. And I told him, look, I had a shift in my mentality, a shift in what I believed was important to my life. Right? I didn't want to waste, um, the sacrifice that my parents had done for me, right. To put me here on the States and, you know, help me through college and all that stuff. Right. Um, and, and I said, look, you could see that through my improvement, right. I became a C student to an A student, right. A minus sure. But yeah, an A student. Right. Um, and uh, I remember he responded and said, yeah, I just clicked the admit button. Welcome to San Jose state stats program. Right. So I gave him additional context on my life. Right. Um, if that helps at all. Um, I don't know, it's attendee. <laughs> and, and then side note, is there like an amateur tennis website that we can look up? And find no. Like I, so I tried. I was not like ranked or scouted or anything like that. I, I think if at my best, I might have been able to play for Division Three. I was not a Division One player by any scope of imagination. Mm -hmm. uh, started too late. I think I took it really seriously. Uh, didn't have coaching. Um, I play about 4.550, which is a pretty high level. Um, like, uh, yeah, it's pretty like maybe top, 5% of, and for five, for 5.0, it was like top maybe two or 1% of all the ratings in the U S but I wasn't good enough for college for sure. So, yeah. All right. Um, and then, uh, Vivek came back with another question. And, uh, so to give you some background on them, uh, they're saying they are a recent international graduate student. Uh, they did their master's in machine learning and also mm -hmm. has three years of work experience. They've been trying to land a job for some time now, but I've been receiving back-to-back -back rejections and they don't have a lot of time left to find a job. So is there any way, do you have any advice on how to make this process speed up? Whew. Um, well, first of all, hang in there, buddy. Um, at least I admire and respect your, your effort, right? Job hunt sucks. Keep it up. Um, uh, man, don't have a fast taste in the process. I mean, I, there's so much context that I'm, I'm lacking, I guess, because it's like, are, are you making it to the final rounds? Are you getting rejected at the door? And if it's maybe at the door, then maybe it's a resume thing or a timing thing, right? If it's right before, it, you're, if you're getting to on-sites and you're getting to final rounds, right? Then maybe it's interview strategy is a certain area you want to work on, right? Um, I would, I guess, depending on where you are in that journey, I would probably identify what you can do better. Um, and uh, again, just know that the job hunt is rough like that, right? Um, but I, I guess the other thing, I, I mean, I, 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 it's hard for me to answer, Nathan, because I don't have the full context, right? right. Um, but I would say, like, um, just hang in there, man. Like, I know it sounds so bad, but just do your best, right? That's all I can say, right? And just If it's important, go for it, right? Um, and I'm sorry, I, I just don't have the context. I can't fully, like, no, it's yeah. Hard. yeah. Um, all right, and then... Uh, this person also came back with a second question. Okay. Um, yeah. This is the person who I called Kang. And I think their first, I think it's actually Kanguello. Gosh, mm. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I've never pronounced that name before. Um, but they are currently a data analyst with Power BI. Uh, they mostly work with SQL. Um, and with the SQL ex and with SQL experience, how important is pandas over SQL on data science? And if they have pandas, do they really need SQL? I love pandas. They're a very cute animal. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, I think, so I don't work with Python too much, but I believe it's a manipulation um, package within Python that you can use for pandas, right? Um, if you can connect to the SQL database through, uh, well, let me read the question here. Mostly, what is SQL experience? So, okay, I think the, the, the concern here is more um, SQL 
it's very good at querying. I think if you're really good at SQL, you could do aggregation, summations, pivot, pivoting the tables. But there are just some things that you cannot do in SQL that you need to be able to do in Python. Right now, of course, there are like the manipulations you do in SQL. I think you can do in Python with a package like Pandas, I believe. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, R would be D ply uh, D D ply Y R. Right. Um, you, I think it's best just to have both. Right. Um, and I, I agree that there is some overlap there. Right. Um, but sometimes you just need to bang out a hardcore SQL query, right? Maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe the database doesn't allow external connections. So you need to write a SQL query and then port the data to like a third location and then have Python point at that location as well, right? Um, and I think I agree there's some, you can do manipulations in pandas or in, in, in Python as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there's some, again, there's some things that Python can do that SQL cannot do, right? Uh, visualizations, for instance, comes to mind, right? Power BI, I agree with you, you can use that, but hey, maybe you work for a company that can't afford Power BI, right? Python is free, right? R is free, right? So. Uh, my answer to that. <laughs> All right, we have two more questions left. I'm gonna make these the last questions. So sorry if you um, ask a question after this, but we only have 10 minutes left and I wanna make sure we give Jimmy a little bit of time to get back to work today. Thank um, you. So uh, an anonymous attendee is asking, can you give us a brief explanation of uh, the using of data science in Cambridge, Cambridge Analytica? I cannot because I have not been following that case. Um, I believe it's something with Facebook or election or something. I don't know. I've, yeah, I haven't really followed uh, yeah. it either. It's a little yeah. above me. So yeah, I, I am not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, I can't comment on that. Not because I don't want to, <laughs> because I just don't have the context, right? Um, right. Yeah. And then uh, last question uh, from Varsha. Hey, Jimmy, great talk, smiley face. How can one transition from data engineer to a data scientist role? Oh, you're close. If you're already a data engineer, it's uh, it's it's like a sister team. Talk to the data scientist that you support. It's a lateral right? move. <laughs> it's a lateral move. It's uh, um, yeah. I mean, if you're a data engineer, then there must be data scientists you're working with, or at least some someone out there who is consuming this data. Otherwise, you know, why would you need a data engineer, right? There's no downstream consumption, right? Um, talk to them, see what it's like, right? I'm sure you have strong relationships with them. Just talk to them and see see what's out there. That's what I would say. All right, perfect. Well, thank you so much, Jimmy. And thank you for taking two hours out of your day to, <laughs> to spend with us. Um, based off of all the comments and all the questions, I think everybody really enjoyed, you know, learning about your journey. Um, thank you, Fatima, for, for, you know, scheduling this and getting us online with Jimmy. And then also, I want to call out Mary in the chat again, because you've been killing it this entire yeah. time. So <laughs> um, uh, thank you all. Um, and I hope you know, I hope we see you all next week at our at our um, webinars and events. Um, if not, I'm sure we'll see you again sometime. So, Jimmy, have a good Friday. Have a good weekend. And um, we'll see you all around. See you guys. Thanks, everyone.